is all very, very encouraging, frankly. I mean, when you're talking about all these things, yeah. I get a sense they're kind of down in the noise. You think about them, but there aren't all that many people, yeah, right? True. What about the thing that used to be really the, 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 the bugaboo of, of HIV treatment, HIV patients, positive patients, which are the opportunistic infections. And the ones that I recall are tuberculosis, uh, cryptococcal meningitis, well, PCP, all these things. We used to say it isn't the HIV that's killing them, it's all these other things. How do you, you balance the H ART therapy with right. the anti, uh, with the therapy for the, the opportunistic infection? It, it, it turns out that, that the patients who benefit the most from antiretroviral therapy are just the people you describe the ones with opportunistic infections. And so there's a sense of urgency we have of getting them on to antiretroviral therapy as soon as feasible, much more so for those patients than for any other group. We recently had a, a woman in our hospital newly diagnosed with cerebral toxoplasmosis, for example, whose CD4 saccharin was 14. You know, that patient, yes, we treat the cerebral toxoplasmosis, but the clock is ticking to get them on antiretroviral therapy. Now, you have to put up with some maybe drug-drug interactions, some polypharmacy, maybe some immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, but those are trade-offs we're willing to make in exchange for the improved outcome that's been proven in randomized clinical trials for people who start ART early rather than and, waiting. And that's really what's amazing with yeah. HIV. We're so fortunate in that there have been so many large randomized control yeah trials that inform all of our decision making. And in particular, we have large randomized control trials that tell us that people who present with advanced immune suppression and opportunistic infections actually benefit not just from early therapy, but you can show that if you start them within two weeks, somebody with PCP, that they'll do better than if you wait six weeks. Yeah. And the same thing is true for people with TB with advanced immune suppression, C4 less than 50. So we have a lot of great data. One of the Conundrums has always been the cryptococcal meningitis, which is probably one of the most common opportunistic infections people present to, to our hospital mm -hmm. with nowadays. Mm. And that's hard because of this iris issue right. in that not well, only- Define that, what's an iris So issue? this immune reconstitution oh, okay. inflammatory syndrome where you, give the, you enhance their immune response and then they have an inflammatory reaction to the antigen. And unfortunately the antigen in this case is residing in a fixed compartment Right. In the central nervous system. So they get system. cerebral edema. Yeah. So they develop cerebral edema. And, and not only is it a bad place to develop inflammation, but it's also really common. You know, it's okay. like 25, 30% of the people who well, develop crypto If the cryptococcal meningitis is that common, and really their best hope is a competent immune system, and yet, yeah. It's right. the immune system that makes kill them. Yeah. What do you do, young doctors? <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it's a delicate balancing act. And what I always love to talk to the residents and fellows when we have a case like this is I say, why don't you read the paragraph in the guidelines? Because <laughs> it basically says, well, you could start early, but then you might not want to start early. <laughs> right, it's really, you could wait until it's kind of late. The but guidelines that may are not great, but that either. is like the biggest waffle in exactly. the guidelines. Is so what to says, do that. And yeah. we still fight about it because the, the best randomized data comes from a uh, a resource limited setting. It comes from and Africa. And for, comes from Africa. And those data suggest that if you start early, you actually increase mortality. If you okay. start early, increase mortality. They don't suggest it. They They're, definitively demonstrate they, well, yeah, it in they, the clinical they, trial. They demonstrate it, right. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. I, so what, uh, what do you say? Right. That you go after the cryptococcal meningitis first with an anti-cryptococcal drug, yes. right, sure. knock yes. the burden right. down, right. and, and the question is when, when in that process do you yeah. start? And I think, so this we could argue, yeah. I think that he, it, it, that in a kind of uh, first world setting, whatever we call ourselves, uh, resource rich setting, um, that you start early. I mean, you don't start you know, day one or day two, but, but you start around two weeks. That's what I do. Yeah. And, and you just get ready for this iris and, and you prepare for it and you prepare the patient for it. I, I, I agree with other you. Other people, and like I fight I, with Charlie Vanderhorst. He, I he don't. Says six, you wait six weeks. I so, wait four so to six weeks. Has, four to six weeks on the anticryptococcal therapy and then reconstitute. There is, right. there is a, um, you know, an analysis of timing of ART in resource-rich settings that suggests that early is probably okay. It's not randomized. There's only a small number of randomized patients in one study. Can I mention about tuberculosis? Please do. I was going to go because, there anyway. Because tuberculosis <laughs> is, is decreasingly no, no, like common in the United States, but still happens. And it is extremely challenging to treat because TB treatment includes rifampin. And rifampin is the biggest pain in the world when it comes to drug interactions. So a lot of the drugs that we commonly use for ART don't get along well with rifampin. 
And so it's sort of this, this kind of separate world of the people with HIV and TB. They get a slightly different antiretroviral approach than people without TB. So. And, and you can see some serious iris. Some of it oh, actually terrible. has, yeah. uh, t I mean, you know, 40 degree temperatures for days on end. You have to give them steroids and you can get some Oh, great. You're going to give somebody who's immunocompromised. You have to. You have to. Yeah, you have to. But I guess the saving grace is that it's not a closed compartment. Right, yeah, right. Unless it's, T right. unless it's TV cerebral meningitis. TV. So TV meningitis. That's you a do, that's, different animal that's, that's, also. That's as bad yeah. as cryptococcal yeah. meningitis, perhaps even worse. I mean, we, we just never see it. Yeah. So. But there too, you have, a, you have a, at least a static therapy. Right. right. I'm not sure, sure anybody, anything is really sidled against TB really at the end of the day. Right but you can knock it down. Yeah, right? definitely. I mean, uh, this all goes to my early ID professor who said, antibiotics, schmantibiotics. Uh, it's the white cells that kill everything. And all you're, holding, all you're doing is holding everything in check for the body to go after it. And you're putting that in steroids when you give them the ART therapy. Well, yet you have to treat bad iris with something. Because as Joe was alluding to, these are patients who are very sick. I mean, right. they have really hectic fevers. You know, if they, if they have mesenteric adenitis, they have terrible abdominal pain. If they have lymph nodes in the chest, you know, they're coughing. I mean, it's, it, it can be very difficult. And we've certainly all seen, yeah. you know, uh, abdominal uh, rupture from mesenteric nodes sure. uh, in the iris. It, uh, absolutely. So, so it's, it's, not, it's then, not just treating fever.